This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis beginning with verse 1 through verse 8. Genesis 17, 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And also I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, the last time it is recorded that God spoke to Abraham was in the 16th chapter when or 15th chapter, when he was 86 years old. And God had spoken to Abram at that time and told him not to be afraid, that God would be his shield and his great wealth. Abram was already a very wealthy man. He had just given away a fortune, but he still had plenty. And God said, I will be your wealth. And Abraham said, God, I'm not worried about my own wealth. What I'm concerned about now is I don't have anybody to leave it to. The only heir I have is a servant. I don't have any children. And so when he was 86 years old, God said to him, Your servant will not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body, he will be the heir. Come outside, Abraham. Look up at the stars. See if you can count them for number. So shall your seed be. And we are told that Abram believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Though he was 86 years old, at this point God promised that God would give to him an heir from his own body and that from Abram would come a multitude. Immediately after, in chapter 16, Sarah came up with some possibility thinking. <laughs> she said, Abram, I don't think it's going to happen. And so I've been thinking, why don't you take my handmaid, Hagar, and raise up through her a child? And I will take the child as my own and he can become your heir. It's sort of, honey, I know that you have this real desire to have a child. Obviously, I can't have one. So let's provide. Let's help God out, you know. And you take Hagar and I'll just take the child and, and you'll have your heir. So... Abram listened to Sarah, took Hagar, and a son was born. But God didn't speak to him for 13 years. God was silent. Now Abram is 99 years old before God speaks again. Now, as God speaks to him again, when he's 99 years old, why do you suppose that God waited so long to speak to him again? When we look at the book of Romans chapter 4, and Paul is talking about this particular promise of God and Abram's faith, Paul tells us that Abram did not stagger at the promise of God. 
He tells us that he did not consider his own body not dead, being about 100 years old. To me, that is declaring that Abram is now impotent. His own body is now dead. Nor did he consider the deadness of Sarah's womb, which indicates to me that she had now passed through the menopause. So God waits now until possibility thinking won't work anymore. He's beyond the point of any physical way by which he can help God perform his promise. He's impotent. Sarah is through the menopause. And God says to him now, Now, Abram, I'm going to give you a son. I really mean it, you know. <laughs> but he had to wait. He waited now for 13 years. Until it was obvious that it's totally impossible for Abram to do anything about the circumstances or there is no way that he can help God fulfill the plan of God concerning now his descendants. And so when he was 99 years old, God spoke to him. God often has to wait for us until we have exhausted every possible resource. He waits until we get to that point of hopelessness. Until we just look at it and we say, that's it, I've had it, I can't do anything, I give up, I, I, I just, I'm through, I just give up, it's all over, there's no sense of even trying anymore. And, and that's the point that Abram had come to. And God waited for him to come to that point before he spoke to him again. Had he spoken any earlier, then Abram would have tried probably some other method, some other way. But God let it become a place where Abram now could do nothing about it in the physical. And God now repeats the promise again. I'm so prone myself to keep trying. I'm very stubborn. I rarely give up. I'll look for another angle. I'll look for another way. And because of my stubborn resoluteness, God often just has to wait for me to expire every plan, to try every avenue, until I come to the realization it's impossible. There's no way that it can be done. And then God steps in. And he begins to do the impossible. But he lets me get to the point of, of despair. The point of throwing up my hands. That point of saying it's all over. When I was a teenager, I was a lifeguard and I went through the Red Cross training to get my certificate and one of the things that they taught us was that when a person is in the water drowning and flailing in the water and all, you do not approach them directly. If you come too close to them in that condition while they are still strong and flailing, they are apt to grab you and get sort of a chokehold on you and, and they can take you down with them. So if you made the mistake and approach them too closely, they get you in a chokehold, then you deliberately go under water, bring them under with you so they'll panic and let go. But they teach you as you're approaching a person in this drowning condition, flailing in the water, when you get near them, dive underwater, grab them by the knees and turn them around. Then work your way up your, their body till you can get your arm over their chest and under the armpit and then you begin to swim with them. Or you just sort of 
stay out of reach of them and you start talking to them, assuring them that you are there, that you're able to take them and help them in, just relax now, and you talk to them and you wait really till they quit flailing. Sometimes you have to wait until they've just exhausted themselves. They, they just, you know, they, they just have tried, I mean, they've tried and they're, they're, they're just tired now and they just, you know, I'm going to go down and you let them just sort of get to that point of expending all of their energy because if you move in too quickly while they're still flailing, it can cost you your life as well as theirs. I think God works on this same principle with us. As long as we are flailing, as long as we are trying in ourselves, as long as we are, we are you know, looking for another angle, as long as we're looking for another way, God just sits back and he watches us as we flail, as we kick, hears us as we scream. And it's finally when we just give up and say, I'm through, glub, 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 you know, that <laughs> underneath the everlasting arms and God takes us and begins to work out now his plan and, and he begins to unfold that whole glorious plan that he had the whole time. Why does God wait so long to act? Partly because of his nature of love. You see, one of the characteristics of love we are told in 1 Corinthians 13 is that it suffers long, or is long-suffering, and it is kind. In the psalm that we read today, that last verse said, if you'll observe these things, you can learn of the loving kindness of God. What things was he talking about? He was talking, and notice how many places, where man came into a desperate situation. The moment he got into this desperate situation, what does it say? And then he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard him, and then the Lord delivered him. Oh, that men would give thanks to God. And then he brings up another situation. And they got into a mess. And they got to where they were desperate. And in their desperation, they called unto the Lord. And the Lord hearkened. And the Lord delivered them. And, you know, you're, you're out to sea. And, and the uh, violent storm. And you're tossed to and fro. And, and you despair of life. And then they cried unto the Lord. And the Lord heard them and delivered them. And brought them into the harbor. Oh, that men... would give thanks to God. But you learn, he said, observe now these things and you'll discover the loving kindness of God. How that God in his loving kindness just waits for us to come to the end of ourselves. For you see, God hates boasting or braggarts. He said that Pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. God knows what a horrible, dangerous thing pride is. And God doesn't want man glorying or boasting in his capacities and in his abilities because he doesn't want man trusting in the weakness of himself. If I am a very self-reliant, self-assured person, I'm going to be faced one day with problems that I can't handle. But if I've only learned to rely upon myself and trust in myself, I'll know not what to do in that hour. But if I have learned through the years to trust in the Lord for all things, to lean not to my own understanding, but just to turn everything over to him. Then when these situations arise that are greater than I am capable of dealing with, God's in control. He'll take care of it. And I see the power in the hand of God. And, and I can't really rejoice and say, well, I worked hard and I, I thought and I thought and I finally figured out a way. And I said, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And I finally was able to overcome every obstacle and every hurdle. And I conquered and I saw the victory, you know, and blah, 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 blah you know. <laughs> brag, brag, boast, boast. And God says, oh, poor thing. You don't know that I was there the whole while, guy. You know, we're so willing to take credit for what God has done. 
like the little kid who was playing on the barn up on the roof, started sliding. And as he was sliding down the roof towards the edge, he cried out, God, help me, help me, God. About that time, his pants got caught on a nail and they came to a ripping halt. And he looked up, he said, never mind, God, nail stopped me. <laughs> so prone to do that, aren't we? We cry unto God and when God delivers, we go, oh, never mind, Lord, I was able to handle it. <laughs> when God intervenes, we, we, we so rarely see the hand of God. And we go on both saying, and so God has to let us come to that place of complete helplessness, of total despair. So that we won't boast when the victory finally comes. You remember when God came to Gideon as he was threshing the wheat in the cave because uh, the Midianites had come into the land. They were like grasshoppers, so many of them. Over 135,000. And every time they would gather their crops, the Midianites would take them away from them, rip them off. So he was hiding in a cave, threshing the wheat, when the angel of the Lord appeared to him, and he said, Gideon, thy, thou mighty man of valor, go in this your might and deliver the children of Israel from the Midianites. Gideon said to the angel, would you check your orders? You've got the wrong address, man. You can't be talking to me. Don't you know that my dad is, is one of the least families in his tribe and I'm the least one in my dad's house? Got your orders mixed up. Angel checked his orders and said, it's you. And he said, I want to be sure. And of course, he put out the fleeces and all. Then the Lord said, call the nation of Israel to battle. So he sent out a call for men to volunteer to fight against the Midianites and 32,000 showed up against the 135,000 Midianites. And God looked at Gideon and said, Gideon, sorry, but you've got too many men with you. <laughs> Gideon said, you've got to be kidding. I said, no. He said, I know the heart of these people. I know that if I would deliver the Midianites into their hands, they would go around bragging how strong and valiant and brave and tough they are. So you go out to those men and you say, all of you guys that are afraid to go into this battle now, go on home. So Gideon went out to his 32,000 and he said, oh, every one of you guys that are afraid to go to battle, you can go on home. More than two-thirds left. 22,000 of them turned and went home. Now God saw the odds. At least 13 and a half to one. Gideon had 10,000 men, and the Lord said, Gideon, we got a problem here. You've got too many men. Again, he said, I know the hearts of these people. That's the problem. God knows us, you see. He knows our hearts. He knows our desire to glory in ourself and in our flesh and what I am able to do and what I'm capable to do if I just set myself and if I just determine and if I just, if I, I, I. And God knows that. And so he said, take him down to the brook, Gideon, let him get a drink of water. And you watch him. Everyone who puts his face in the water to drink, send him home. Gideon went down to the spring of Enharad, and there in that little brook that comes out of the stream, he said, okay, guys, get a drink before we go. And 9,700 of them put their faces down in the water, and Gideon says, okay, guys, go home. He's left with 300 men. Hey, this is ridiculous. This is impossible. The odds are impossible. God said, with these 300, I will now deliver the Midianites unto you. But you see, God let it get to the place where it was just humanly impossible so that there is no way that they could now boast in what they had done. When the victory now comes, all they can do is praise God. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his marvelous works. But even when God works in a marvelous way, many times we are not prone to praise him. We're prone to give some rationalistic explanation and, and uh, praise luck. Oh, man, I had such a lucky day. You can't believe how lucky I was, you know. And, and we, we're not 
giving God the credit for the work and the things that he has done. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works and for his goodness. And so in order that we will, God so many times lets us get to that point of desperation and giving up. So when he was 99 years old, <laughs> you can't do it anymore, Abram. It's impossible now for you to help me. You're going to know that when your child is born, it was only God. You couldn't do it yourself. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Now this is the first time that God revealed himself as the almighty God. El Shaddai, or El Shaddai. The almighty God, El Shaddai. You can't do it, Abram. I can. Why? Because I'm almighty God. You're weak. You're incapable. But I'm almighty God. Now, God makes several promises to him here. He promises to multiply him abundantly, to make him the father of many nations, and he changed his name. You'll no longer be called Abram, but Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude. And he promised that kings would come from him and that his descendants would inherit the land. Now, it is interesting to note the next time God reveals himself as almighty God is in the 35th chapter of Genesis. The next time he reveals himself as almighty God, it's to Jacob. And it is interesting to note in the 35th chapter when God comes to Jacob at Bethel and presents himself as the almighty God, it was there that God said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. So God changed his name when he revealed himself as the almighty God, even as he did now to Abram, changing the name to Abram. He did at that same revelation, change the name of J Jacob to Israel. And if you will notice also in chapter 35, when he reveals himself as almighty God, he repeats the very same promises that he made to Abram. That is, he was going to multiply Jacob abundantly. He would make him the father of many nations. Kings would come from him and his descendants would inherit the land. Now, these things could only happen as the result of an almighty God. They wouldn't be able to do it when it, within and of themselves. It would take an almighty God to bring to pass these promises that he is now giving. Now, the Lord said to Abram, walk before me blameless or perfect. You say, but that's impossible. Nobody's perfect. Did God, does God really mean perfect when he says walk before me perfect? Does he really mean perfect? Do you think that God would ask anything less from you? Do you think God would say, well, you know, walk before me best you can. You know, it's crummy and it's pretty shoddy, but walk before me in a shoddy way. No. I think that God is sort of rebuking him here in a way for this little episode with Hagar where when God gave the promise before Abram then you know took Hagar and tried to fulfill the promise of God and, and didn't trust in God to fulfill it. Now God is saying hey I'm the almighty God walk before me perfect. In the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you remember Jesus closed that sermon by saying, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. You say, but I can't be perfect. Of course you can't. 
I'm glad that you realize that. I'm glad that you've given up. Now God has a chance to do his work in your life. You see, that's what it's all about. God will do for you what you can't do for yourself. God will take these impossible situations in your life and if you will just give up and say, but I can't do it and turn it over to him, you'll discover that he is the almighty God and he is able to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And he wants to do for you in order that when it is done, you won't go around bragging and saying, well, I'm perfect, you know, after all. But you can say, hey, I'm a mess, but oh, how God has strengthened me, how God has helped me. I mean, that used to be a real weakness in my life. Man, I stumbled over that. You can't believe how many times. And I tried so hard not to do that. I tried every method. Man, everybody came along with a suggestion. I followed it until finally I realized, hey, there's no way that I can't do it. And then God came in and he strengthened me and he helped me and God turned things around and God and God and God you know and and so your whole witness is no longer and I and I and I but it's God and God and God as you're telling and relating what the almighty God has done as he revealed to you his loving kindness for you walk before me blameless God said to Abram now this requirement is tied together with the nature of God being almighty. Notice God said, walk before me, the preposition before. Uh, in Deuteronomy, God says to Israel, now walk after me. Concerning Noah and Enoch, it said, and they walked with God. And in Colossians, Paul tells us in chapter 2, verse 6, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk you in him. Four different prepositions used to relate to our walk with God. First of all, Abraham walked before me like a child out here playing in the field and his father is watching over him. Walk before me. To Israel, walk after me. The place of the servant was to walk after their masters. And so when Israel is commanded to walk after God, it was, they were being commanded to serve the Lord. With Enoch and Noah who walked with God, there is fellowship, communion, walking with God. But when Paul tells us to walk in Christ, there is union. There is the power now in Christ to do it. And now God declares to Abram what he is going to do. Abram had tried, and Abram could not do it in himself. He had now come to the place where it was no sense even trying anymore. His body was now dead, and Sarah's womb was now dead. And now God says, I will do this. And there are six I wills of God in the next few verses here as God declares to Abram, what God is now going to do. And I will make my covenant between you and me. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you. And I will give you and your descendants the land. And I will be their God. And the God here declares his work and what he is going to do. Now what does it mean when God allows you to come to the end of yourself? And maybe you are there today. Maybe there's a situation where it's impossible. I mean, you've tried everything, but no way. And, and, and you're really expecting tomorrow the hammer to come down. It's all over. You did your best. You tried. You did everything you knew. You worked every angle there was. And it's failed. It's all over. You haven't anything left. No more plans. No more schemes. It's over. Hey, are you ever in good shape? 
For man's extremities are God's opportunities. Now that's not a scripture. Probably should be. God so often allows us to come to the end of ourselves. He does not act prematurely. He lets the scene look totally hopeless. I don't have any more strength. I don't have any more energy. I don't have any more ideas. It's over. That's it. Had it. Good. Good. Because you're about to see the Almighty God turn the situation around like you had never dreamed possible. You're about to see God at work as he reveals his loving kindness to you in such a way that only God can get credit and only God can get glory and you will be in the position of the psalmist who said, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. And you're going to just go your way saying, Oh, praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I didn't think it could happen, but it's happening. One of the greatest joys of my whole life is watching God work the impossible. I love it. Just seeing God turn around these impossible situations and know that God is at work and God's hand is at work and you just stand and you watch God and you just stand there giving glory and praise to Him. And that's what it's all about. He wants to be your God. He wants to work in your behalf. He wants to reveal His power to you, And even in this situation where you feel so desperate and hopeless today, you don't think that anything could ever come of this. Watch God perform his work. And as God said to the king when the battle was just... They had been wiped out. God said, now stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For this battle is not yours, but God's. You're not going to have to raise a spear. I'm going to wipe them out, God said. And as he talked to their enemies, I mean, they had looked with fear and, and awe upon this horde that had come against them. God just said, hey, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. It's time that you just sort of stand still. Give up. Turn it over to God. Let him now work. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your loving kindness to us. Thank you, Lord, for your patience. Oh, God. How you have waited for us as we have gone through our many little exercises to try to deliver ourselves. You've been so patient, Lord, with our fumblings, our endeavors, our efforts. And now, Lord, we've tried it all. Nothing works. It's time for you, O oh Lord, to work. Time for you to take over. God, we turn over to you now this impossible situation of which we have no more control, no more hope even in ourselves. And now, Lord, do your work. <laughs> Bring glory to your name. Oh, God, that men would praise the Lord for his marvelous works and for his goodness to the children of man. In Jesus' name, amen. It could be that there are things in your life that you've been doing your best to correct and improve. 
Certain things that you've been saying, hey, I won't do that again, but you're sort of bound and you're trapped and, and here you are doing it again and again and again. And you, and you feel like, hey, no sense trying anymore. I mean, it's just, I might as well learn to live with it. Maybe you've been thinking, boy, if I could just really clean up my act, I, I would then like to give my life to Jesus Christ. And you've tried to clean up your act, but you just don't have the capacity. You've got the cart before the horse. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Let him come and dwell within you. Walk in him. And as you do, you'll discover the power of the almighty God to change and transform you and do for you what you can't do for yourself. I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room. You can find God's help today for your life and for your situations. Just go back and say, God, I've had it. Take over. I am God Almighty, he declared to Abram. Walk before me. Blameless. And this is what I'm going to do for you. <laughs> and believe me, God can and will do it for you too. May the Lord be with you, give you a beautiful, blessed week as you watch God work through his mighty power in those impossible situations of your life. And may you see his victory and rejoice in him. In Jesus' name.